Excellent. PDA 5050. What works, what fails, and what's next? We are at the Mobile Robot Mashup 2025. A hands-on demonstration where mobile robots from different providers are steered using VDA 5050. The brain behind this year's mashup is the so-called Feed Executor, a master control software provided by MHP. We're going to use the opportunity and talk to the product owners. Matthias Beiswenger and Katharina Grimm will provide you with the latest updates on VDA 5050. So stay with us and let's get into it. Automation Awakenings your weekly dose of best practices for logistics automation. Welcome to another episode of the Automation Awakenings podcast live from the Mashup 2025. And I'm really happy to welcome Katharina Grimm and Matthias Beiswenger from MHB here on stage with me. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for having us. Guys, um, uh, how do you feel after two days of Mashup? Great or mashed up? Mashed up and tired, to be honest. No, it's really great to see now live here. Yeah. Perfect. So um, we are very happy you found some time to talk to us because it's going to be all about VDA 5050 today. Um, and we collected some questions from the community. So um, I'm going to grill you a bit more, but I think we are almost done with the, with the day either way, right? Yes. Okay, perfect. Then let me start with the first question. And uh, we go with uh, one which, well, which is connected to the mashup itself. Um, how did you tackle the technical challenge of connecting all of these different providers to the fleet executor using VDA 5050? Mm, I think that's quite easy to answer. First of all, most of them are already onboarded. So actually that was quite easy. Only use cases was the topic. But for all the others, we have a procedure, like a normal procedure with starting with assessment, a table, checking what version. It was quite clear, version 2.0 here. Yeah, yeah. Next step is to check what specific topics they need, what specific um, actions are needed. And the next case is then we go over for testing, remote testing. And after that, it was really easy to settle everything what's needed. Mm -hmm. Yes, and we got like a test layout from every vendor before okay. and did like remote testing. Mm -hmm. and checked all the VDA 5050 tests. We, yeah. yeah. What would you say was the biggest technical challenge? The biggest technical challenge, I would say, was like that we this year present a full process chain. So the mm -hmm. AGBs are not driving around in their own circles. So okay. every AGB step is connected to each other. And for sure, if one AGB stops, it affects the whole chain. Oh, so yeah. there we need to be like, or we needed to be, especially with the mechanical positioning, very precise. So that pallets are in the right place, especially here in the inner cell. Right. Yeah, that's, that's a change in comparison to last year's edition, right? Yes. The chaining of the use cases, the procedures, yeah, by far the most challenging topic, especially with the communication with all the vendors. All right. Eight How many vendors do we have? Eight. Eight different, ten different vehicles. So it was quite exhausting, but it worked out really, really well, I would say. Yeah, uh, congrats. I believe uh, much energy and much effort went into that. Yeah. Yes. But let's stay uh, with the use cases uh, themselves. So um, we see uh, many different use cases uh, down there on the shop floor, on the test floor, so to say. Which one was the most challenging? You see here on the right side, the inner cell. Mm -hmm. And this was like the most challenging because for sure we needed to connect the cell itself, but also three different AGVs are driving into the cell. The KUKA, Active Shuttle and Safe Lock. Mm -hmm. And there like three processes came together. And I think it was there especially it was like kind of tricky in the beginning to position a pallet in the right way because also the camera system of the inner cell needs the correct position to then start the pelletization process. Okay. What is the inner cell, Matthias? The inner cell. That is actually what you see behind it. It's a depelletation robot. Ah, okay. Actually, it's connected to our fleet managers. So we are controlling it and make sure that no one else, especially humans, can walk in and get hurt or something else. Of course. So that was a really important and crucial part of the whole setup. So, next question from the community is, um, uh, is what we see here already plug and play? Already plug and play. That's a good question. Maybe I give the question back. So, let's say like that we had two and a half days for the initial setup. Yeah. We came here on Sunday or actually Saturday. We have, like I said, eight vendors, 10 HEVs. We have chain processes and we have previously more or less two and a half months. So. The question is, I would say it's plug and play, two and a half day for the integration. It's rather fast and that's everything done 
with the VDA 5050 and our fleet executor. But we need to say that for sure the planning phase before is yeah. really important. Yeah, of to course. Get all the vendors together to get the customer VDMA here all on one table so that also when we arrive here, everybody knows what is going mm. well and we are all aligned. Excellent. So if I'm a customer and I decide to get the fleet executor, yeah. all of the providers that drive down there, all eight of them uh, could be deployed without any major uh, challenges yeah. anymore. Actually, that's true. So I think the biggest challenges are mostly related then to the setup, the use case, and maybe the peripherals. Like if you have gates, elevators and stuff like that, but only the HEVs, you can do that basically in hours if needed. Okay. That's quite fast. You need a fact sheet that's really mandatory, that makes it much easier. And what is also really important, that's also from the VDMA, is the lift format. So that we get the lift format, what we describe together for the use case, and that we are really fast, we can merge them, and then you're set it for the first pilot, actually. Mentioning the lift format, yeah. um, uh, let's talk a bit more about the VDA 5050 itself. Let's talk about the standard. Yeah. So we are currently on standard uh, version 2.1. Yes. Um, where, that is, where does this version still hits, uh, hits the wall? I mean, like, is there uh, still functions that are not available and which have to be implemented using workarounds? I think maybe that's easy to answer. I mean, it's not a major, it's a minor version. And I think what everyone is looking forward, integration of AMRs. Compared to the 2.0, what we have now is corridors. As you could see also here with the active shuttle. So we have the possibility to have like a trajectory over the edges with the 2.1, yeah. but it's not a full support for AMRs, completely free navigation of HV. I think that's a part that's lacking, but yeah, will be done quite soon. Mm -hmm. And additionally, I think what is upcoming also a lot of customers um, or vendors need some kind of middleware or yeah. military systems. And they are also the M2X um, increases like uh, it's getting more and more important to also have the interfaces described to assets, peripherals, upper layer logistics systems and so on. Yeah. Talking about uh, versioning, um, uh, we are all waiting for version 3.0. Uh, is it worth waiting? It is, definitely. Yeah. For sure. I mean, I teased it already, to be honest, but yeah, I think it's definitely. quite worth, especially for our customers. It's such an accelerator for integrating AMRs. Mm -hmm. As you can see, for example, the character it's a complete AMR. Yeah. Now you are able to integrate it quite easy and you are really, really easily can them guide it over zones. And this is a big accelerator for every use case, for every customer. So definitely looking forward. The zones concept, yeah. And that we also get like the plan paths and back for yeah. visualization yeah. and already can show what is planned by the AGV itself. So basically, basically, obstacle avoidance is one big topic, right? That will be enabled with the new zone concept that will be released. I mean, not only the obstacle avoidance, we could also say the, uh, the active shuttle can already obstacle avoidance, but it's easier for us to guide an HEV, not on nodes and edges, but also possible to have dedicated zones. Got it. And can then in high sequence send back and forth and therefore um, yeah, make, uh, make it quite easy to have a really dynamic setup in your production. Yeah, and to give them some kind of freedom to move, but also some parameters. Okay, in this area, you already can only pass in this direction, for example. So. Yeah. And also, I think what's important to add with the 3.0 is the degree of freedom with your layout. So what we have with the lift and the 2.0, we have nodes, edges, and if we need a lot of time to set it up, Okay. With an AMR, you're much more free. You need not uh, as a dedicated and clear layout. You can just define the zones, say drive from that point to that point, and the rest is done by the HEV or the AMR, to be honest, not HEVs. Yeah. So basically, you dissolve the nodes and the edges. Yeah. You just uh, replace it with zones that are operated uh, by the AMRs or HEVs. Possibly. And you can do it together. So you have still your virtually lane guided HEVs. Yeah. Together with your AMRs, if you have a process that is more, I would say, with high frequency and has more variety, so mm -hmm. therefore AMR is perfect. For everything else, if you have a really clear throughput, I think the standard AM HEVs are still perfectly in place. Yeah. How will you handle different versions that are on the market? Like uh, someday in the future, we're going to have the version 3.0. Yeah. Then there's going to be still some providers on 2.1 or 2.0 or 1.0. How does this work? I think, like I said in the beginning, what was really important for us here in the mashup was the fact sheet. Yeah. So the fact sheet describes in a high level what version the HV is supporting. 
that we have the initial information we need. So if there's a 1.1 and all the action that are supported, we just import it. And then basic, the HUV is onboarded. The same is done for 2.0, 2.1, and then also for the 3.0. Yeah, and additionally, we still have the possibility to also configure HVs via I, so we can also define the version there. We will still support older versions. Yeah. And we also can define then the optional parameters which are needed. For example, some need the trajectory, some yeah. that's also then possible okay. to configure it via the UI. So versioning is not really a problem. You guys got this covered. Yeah. So already whatever uh, your customer brings to the table. You can you can handle it. I think mainly it's related then to the HTTP renders. Depending if they have no uh, fact sheet, for example, then it's like Katarina explained more handwork, uh, so to say. So, what did you learn from this year's smashup personally? What's your biggest uh, insight? I think it's kind of tricky to set up a full process chain. You have a lot of things which can like block the processes, especially yeah. the mechanical positioning. And therefore, you also need to take care, for example, about the station. So because the stations are shared by the different HEV vendors, yeah. and like some, yeah, we need to be very precise there. And there's also a lot of um, yeah, discussions going on so that you take really time before to plan the full process yeah. and yeah, that everybody is aligned. Matthias? I would say the same. I think that is the most challenging part by far, yeah. Alignment. Yeah, alignment, communication. And so many vendors. It's always about a communication. The project management, actually, right? It's like a real cus uh, customer project. Yeah. So, last question: If you had one wish towards the VDA fifty fifty working groups, and I know Matthias, you were an active part of that. Yeah, act Katarina actually also. So yeah, we do it together. So if you had one wish to bring to the table in the working groups, what would it be? Nothing. I can start with that. I, I that quite often I have one wish, and that's more or less about the VDMA in the lift. At the moment, the layout interchange format is unidirectional. So basically from the HEV right. towards the uh, fleet manager. Not backwards. Yeah, not backwards. For us, it's not a big problem, but for our customer, it would be such an such a accelerator to have the possibility to send back a map and have a quite quick update changing the layout. So that would be my why wish bidirectional lift format. And additional, I would say it's also standardization for errors and logging because oh, yeah. as we are connecting more and more AGVs in one process, it would be also nice for us to have like standardized error code so that we can really easily search for the root cause and yeah, I can handle more yeah. Guys, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for the insights. Thank you for coming. It was a great pleasure to talk to you. And to all of our listeners, um, uh, yeah, tune back uh, in two weeks. At Automation Awakenings, we're going to be live another episode. Until then, stay tuned, take care, and goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. This was another episode of the Automation Awakenings podcast. Visit us at automation-awakenings.com 